Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Quadro Karamangtang to discuss his experience as a critical care physician during the COVID-19 pandemic, the importance of metabolic health in COVID-19 infection, and how improving global metabolic health will make us more resilient against future illnesses. Dr. Karamangtang is an ICU doctor and intensivist who seeks to increase the efficiency of medical care with cost effectiveness, dignity, and justice in mind while also seeking solutions to improve healthcare delivery and practitioner wellness. This interview was recorded in partnership with the Charlie Foundation at Metabolic Health Summit 2022. Thanks for listening, and we hope that you enjoy. My name is Kojo Karamantang. I'm an ICU doctor up in Ottawa. I have uh, been um, a host of a podcast called Solving Healthcare, and uh, I'm, I'm here based on the, the stuff that we saw on the front lines dealing with COVID patients and how there was a direct link with metabolic health. And I thought with our platform and our experience and our voice, it would, we had a responsibility to, to talk about how important it was to address these things. So uh, it's a real privilege to be able to come to a group like this and, and, and uh, to chat about this. Honestly, you know, I was there March 2020, first patient to roll through our ICUs, and we were all obviously terrified. We were scared. We were uh, didn't know what to expect. Are we going to be the next Italy? Are we going to be the next New York? And, um, you know, we, we, we got through our first few patients and realized that, you know, we could protect ourselves. We could get our patients through this. And in the back of your mind, you're always worried about, selfishly, are you at risk? Are you? Am I going to be bringing this back to home or am I going to get sick from COVID? And what was clear was that there was a, a direct link with people's metabolic status. You know, we saw tons of obesity. We saw tons of type 2 diabetics, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, all associated with our, our COVID patients. And so when you saw that trend, it was like, we should be telling people what we're seeing so that if we have this window in time, we could promote healthy living. We could promote how to, to try and get people, you know, healthier, fitter, um, get them moving. And, you know, as a, a doctor that has been, you know, I've gra- graduated in t- 2005. Oh, my God, that's a long time. And a lot of these concepts were foreign to me, like learning that, you know, you could reverse type 2 diabetes through whether it's fasting, low carb, or keto, and and how quickly some of these ailments can be reversed. I'm, I was like, let's let's advertise this, let's talk about this, let's promote this. You know, unfortunately, I, I felt like it wasn't something that was well received or wasn't well adopted in in, in mainstream media. So you know, we we thought go through other channels, go through the podcast, go through. Um, uh, social media to, to, to really kind of address these things. And I think, you know, being here, you, you, you realize how many like-minded individuals there are and people that are wanting to promote healthy living, um, improving metabolic uh, disease. And, uh, you know, so a real privilege to be here. And, and I'm learning a ton already. I'm, you know, uh, learn, sat on a couple of sessions on uh, mental health and, and, and uh, ketogenic uh, approaches. So, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. You, you know where I've, so there's twofold. I've really tried to focus on prevention. Like what is going to prevent you from landing in ICU and seeing someone like myself? And this is where we're feeling the most motivated. Like where we look, like to me, it's always about reverse engineering who, who's most likely to land. So we see a lot of, you know, you know patients that are, marginalized communities that, uh, uh, you know, poor access to quality food, poor access to, you know, community services and, 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 and to promote, uh, you know, active living. And so th- th- to me, in my mind, this is where we need to go is, is really advocating for, you know, let's not wait for you to have a problem, but let's address it early before you are at, are at risk of landing in hospital. And then uh, recently we're looking at uh, within the ICU asking ourselves, is there stuff that we could do that are, from, from a nutrition point of view, that could optimize their, their chances of recovery? So, 
you know, we're, we're entertaining a study now of, of time-restricted eating. So right now in, in, in critical care, it's 24-7, you're, you're being fed. Is that, is that good? You know, that question is not clear to me. Um, can we promote uh, low, less inflammatory, uh, like less seed oils, less lower-carb uh, meals uh, when it comes to uh, feeding our, f- our folks in hospital? So these um, ideas really haven't been explored to a, to a great degree within critical care. But certainly, you know, our group, uh, with our research experience, are looking to explore these things. And I, I, my spidey sense... I do wonder if there would be some benefit, like maybe not a huge benefit, but there would be some patient groups that would benefit from an approach that is um, less inflammatory when, when it comes to critical care. Because everything that lands you in ICU is related to inflammation. Like honestly, like you know, COVID, we'll talk about at some point. But you know, pneumonia, uh, sepsis, uh, you know, strokes bleeds in your brain, like all that's related to inflammation. So if we could look at ways of reducing that, I think it would benefit our patients. Yeah, it, this was a huge aha moment for me because, you know, we, we would see a lot of metabolically unhealthy patients that come through the, the ICU for different issues. Uh, but we just kind of accepted it as, you know, that's, that's reality. But, you know, COVID, we would have patients of all ages. Like, you know, you, you would see in the news, um, you know, 25-year-old patient dies of COVID and, you know, they didn't tell you that the patient was 300 pounds, you know, like they, they, that would, that was lost in this. And, and, you know, when you have that ability to, to better someone's metabolic status, to prevent them from landing in hospital, it was, it was like, okay, like we got to really think about this. Like, obviously you don't want to see people land in ICU to, you know, to die, to suffer, to, uh, you know, we, we see patients have chronic ailments after they leave us and and what can we do to prevent that from happening and i mean in the last two years what have we been talking about the most and and it was front and center COVID, and you know so it was hard it really was hard to ignore that direct link and you know chrissy some some people are shocked to hear me say this but in my two plus years of dealing with COVID patients i still haven't taken care of somebody that was completely healthy like, I still haven't seen a completely healthy person with no risk factors land in an intensive care unit. And so with our, our world turned upside down as a result of COVID, you know, this was a huge wake-up call. Like, it was a huge wake-up call that, you know, we need to highlight this. And it, by highlighting it and, act, and doing something about it, not only are we reducing people's um, chances of landing in a hospital from COVID, but you're reducing their risk of, um, you know, cancer, out- improving their cancer outcomes, uh, stroke, heart attacks, uh, kidney disease, all these things that you could, uh, you, mental health, all these things we can improve by, by making a move towards improving people's metabolic health. So uh, massive, massive wake-up call. I want us to make it more, like to promote it and make it more accessible. So for me, it, it comes down to increasing awareness and and increasing uh, access. You know, and one of the areas of, of research for my group is, uh, you know, uh, how to make healthcare dollars go further, like how to be more efficient with our healthcare resources. And uh, one of the things I highlight in, in our talk is that you know, an ICU admission from COVID cost the system over fifty thousand dollars, and I could, and you could imagine what you could do with that amount of money if you could make um, community centers in our and our for for kids to make sure they have ac- access to exercise and 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 activities, um, having education from uh, a nutrition point of view, making whole foods more um, you know accessible and 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 cheaper. Um, you know, having access to health coaches, to quality, you know, uh, dietitians that can really promote uh, the importance of, of uh, food quality. Like, there's so much we could be doing with, with if, we, if our resources were diverted. And I can promise you it would be way more efficient in terms of healthcare spending. That I, I would love that to the future to look like that, to really focus on um, healthy living, making gyms more accessible. You know, you know, I don't know how it is in California, but in Ontario, where I'm from, uh, you know, gyms aren't cheap. 
you know, and and you know a lot of people would benefit from regular exercise, the community that it can be built from that. So, to me, yeah, putting more eggs in that prevention side than the than we've had in the past. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Metabolic Link. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share, subscribe, follow, and leave us a comment or review on whichever platform you use to tune in. We hope you'll join us next time.